Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and we'll look at something today that's going to be something that you, didn't, you don't hear a lot of today, but uh, this social distancing made me think about this, and I, I, I thought about it all week this week, to be honest with you. It hit me about, I think it was Sunday night last week, and I was up laughing about it most of the night thinking about this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14 and then uh, after life in a while I got mad a little while. So I've, I've looked at it long enough that I've seen about every angle you can see from it and I want to preach on something here about that social distancing. Is it social distancing that we should be practicing or biblical separation? Give me something to think about. Now watch, let's look at it in, in chapter 6, look at verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? And what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be that, their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Father, I do ask that you would bless this message. I pray, Lord, that you would just uh, uh, hide me behind the cross, if you would, Lord, and just uh, let, let your word speak to hearts and lives today, Father. I ask that you would just speak to each and every one of us, Lord, and help us all to live a life that's pleasing to you. Help us, Lord, to do just what you would have us to do in these days. And, Father, we do thank you and praise you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, it's funny to me that the world is now calling for this social distancing. Uh, we've even practiced it here. We've got y'all socially distanced in the church. And, and we, we, but the world has called for this, yet we as Christians have been practicing it for years. We've been practicing social distancing. They, they are trying to stay away from a virus they cannot see. Now, we can see the effects of it. It is killing a lot of people. We understand that. We understand the seriousness of it. And they are harping to us. You just don't see how serious it is. Don't you see how serious this is? Lives are being ruined and people are dying because of this. It's affecting their health. It's affecting their families. It's affecting the economy. It's affecting every area of their life. Well, so is sin. And Christians have been trying to biblically separate themselves from sin. And we've been preaching biblical separation for years. They laughed at us. They mocked us. They said that we were cults and legalists, racists, xenophobic. They called us homophobic, bigots, Bible thumpers. They called us better than vows. They called us every name they could think of when we were preaching biblical separation. Yet, when this little virus comes out, all of a sudden they're hollering social distancing. Ain't it funny how the entire world jumped on the bandwagon and instantly, almost overnight, changed their life, changed the nation, yet we've been preaching against something more serious for years. Social distancing, because this might affect your physical life. And we've been preaching biblical separation because this will kill you. It will take your life. It will ruin your marriage. It can ruin everything. And it can send you to hell. Yep. All the coronavirus can do is take your physical life. Make you sick and take your physical life. Sin can affect your physical life and send your soul to hell. Sin is a whole lot more serious, yet when the governor uh, gave his executive order, everybody obeyed. Christ has been saying, 
Christ has said in his word recorded, I just read it, be ye not unequally yoked. Come out from among them, be separate. Love not the world, neither things. Touch not the unclean thing, yet the world just brushes it off like it's nothing. Like it's not important. Well, I'm going to preach a little bit on that. I'm going to preach on the doctrine of separation. More pe it is very seldom preached today and even less practice it today. But it can save your life, your marriage, your home, your church, and it can even save our country. Many people will quit church over this very thing. I'm not looking for any of y'all to quit church. I, I believe most of y'all have good standards and are sound in the Bible. But a lot of people today couldn't take this kind of preaching. A lot of Christians today don't want to hear this kind of preaching. They don't want to hear that they need to get away from sin and there's things that they should not do. They want to live their lives the way they want to. It's sad though. The governor can issue an executive order and say social distance and people will change their lives and obey it instantly without question. Yet God has commanded in his word that we come out from among them and be different. That we be a peculiar people. That we love not the world. That we live for him and people won't obey. It's never been popular it wasn't popular in ancient Egypt's day when they were told to come out from among, among those people around them and not to have gods and idols like they did. It wasn't popular then and it's not popular now. But we're going to look at it anyway. Look at it again with me. We're going to look at, first of all, the contrasts. There's some contrasts there I wanted to point out. That it's in the Word of God. In verse 14, Be not unequally yoked together, with unbelievers. When it says ye, it's talking to believers. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to those who put their faith in Christ. And Paul said, what? He, he said not for believers to be with unbelievers. He's showing a contrast. There's a difference between a believer and an unbeliever. A non-believer, if you would. There should be a difference. Look, keep looking at the second part of that verse. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? It's as far as righteous and unrighteous. It's almost as the difference between east and west, north and south. They're not the same. And then he goes on and he says, And what communion hath light with darkness? See how he's comparing and contrasting them. He's showing the differences. They're not the same. Then in verse 15, he goes on and says, And what concord hath Christ with Belial? And then he says, Or what part hath the he that believeth, the believer, with the infidel, those that don't believe? He compares and contrasts some things. And you can look at that and you can learn a couple of things. First thing you can learn, things that are different aren't the same. Amen? Things that are different. Boy, that sounds real complicated, don't you? You've got to be a genius to understand that. Things that are different are not the same. You say, preacher, I don't understand. Okay, I've got a cat here and I've got a dog here. Now, according to the world standards, they're the same. I look at it and I say, no, they're different. And they say, well, don't they both have fur all over? Yes, yes, they got fur all over. Don't they both have two eyes? Yes. Don't they both have a nose? Yes. Tail? Yes. Don't they both have, you know, two ears? Yes, yes, yes. They do. Don't they all, don't both of them walk on all fours and have paws with nails? Yes, yes. Don't they both have long tails? Yes, yes. Don't, they, if you, oh, here's a go. If you cut them, don't they both bleed red? Yes, yes, they do, they do. But that's a cat and that's a dog. They're not the same. That's right. Ask any Chinese restaurant, they'll tell you. <laughs> They're not the same. Now, I, I'm making a joke, but the truth of the matter is a dog's a dog and a cat's a cat. They're not the same. Yes, they have many similarities, but God made them different for a reason. They have a purpose. They both have a job and a, and, and a service that they can do in His will. Amen? But they're not the same. Now, that's what people don't like. Everybody wants everybody to be the same and everybody to be lumped up into one group. But God's not that way. God is a segregationist. Boy, that goes over good today like a lead balloon. 
Everybody wants everybody to get along and everybody get together, but God is not that way. He showed us that in the very beginning in Genesis 1, he divided the light from the darkness, the day from the night, the land from the sea. He is a segregationist. He divided it. Even in Acts chapter 17, about verse 26, he said he has appointed a, a one man, to dwell on all the face of the earth. And he said the bounds of their habitation. He give us bounds that we're not to cross. He's a segregationist. He divides things. So things that are different are not the same. And secondly, things that are different are meant to be separated. Amen. Amen. You don't see dogs crossing with cats. Nope. Amen. Amen. He gave us that example in creation. Like I said, he separated the day and the night and the dark and the light and the water and the land. He separated everything. Number three, things that are different cannot be joined together without negative consequences. You have confusion and problems that arise when people go against the Word of God and go against nature and try to force things together that don't belong together. He says here for us to come out from among them and not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I'll give you an illustration. You take an unbeliever, an atheist, and they get married to a Christian believer. Do you know what kind of confusion that's going to cause in that home? When they have, well, first right off the bat, are we going to have a church wedding? Or are we not going to have a church wedding? Are we going to pray together as a family or are we not? Are we going to study our Bible or are we not? Do we believe in God or do we not? Then the kids come on the scene. Do we raise them in church and Sunday school or not? Do we teach them to pray or not? You, you see, the confusion that comes from that. Things that are different do not belong together. There will be confusion. And in that confusion, the devil will get in. Yep. And he has. Because man has not listened to God's biblical Separation, and they've joined with those that they should not have. We have a loss of power. We have confusion. We have a like, a, a, a major like of God's presence and power in our day. And we have judgment. So look at those contrasts. You know, you have the believers and unbelievers, righteous with unrighteous, light with darkness, Christ with Belial, believers with infidel, the temple of God with idols. They don't belong together. But that's exactly what we have together. You go in some churches around Christmas time, he's up preaching Christ and got a Christmas tree beside of him. People aren't interested in what he's saying. They're looking at the ornaments on the tree. Sometimes you go into a church and they got a statue of Mary. They're not listening to the preacher. They're thinking about uh, praying and touching that statue because someone reportedly had touched that statue, got healed of something. There, it's full of idols. And even in our Christian circle, sometimes people look to the cross. Now, I understand Paul said we have nothing to glory in but the cross, but the cross was a cruel instrument. That would be like running up to the electric chair and wrapping your arms around the electric chair and praying to the electric chair. It was an instrument of death in Christ's day. Yes, we glory in the cross, but it's not the cross. It's he who died on the cross Amen. that we worship. Secondly, let's look at the commands. The commands there. Look at verse 14. <coughs> it says, be ye not unequally yoked. Verse 17, it says, wherefore come out from among them. Then it says, touch not. So notice verse 14, be ye not. In other words, you can't do it. Don't do it. It ain't right. It's wrong. It's a sin. Don't do it. Be ye not. Then he says, come out. Get out of there. Don't do that. Then touch not. Don't even touch it. Don't even allow yourself to get a hold of it. Put that down. Let me have these dead kids. They ain't said that. Put that down. He come running in the house with a snake in his pocket. Put that down. Anyway, notice the progression though. It started out with be ye not. Then it says come out from it. Then it says don't even touch it again. Notice the progression there. Don't you be that way. You get away from those that are that way. And then don't even touch it no more. Don't even mess with it anymore. 
In 1 Thessalonians 5.22, the Bible says, Abstain from all appearance of evil. In 1 Peter chapter 1, listen to this. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. That's talking about your lifestyle. Verse 16 says, Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Christ wants us to be like him. God is holy, and we are to be like Him. We are to be conformed to the image of His Son, Christ. Amen? And He was holy. Holy comes from a word which means set apart. And when we get saved, listen, I'm not preaching that Christians are better than the world, but when we get saved, the Holy Spirit indwells us. And we should come out from among the world at that point and be set apart, sanctified for His use, for His glory, for His purpose, not our own. That's why we are to be separate. That's why we are to be a peculiar people so that He can get the glory, so that He can use our lives for His purposes. Not that we're better, we're just sinners saved by grace. Amen? Amen? We're not better than the world that's lost around us. We shouldn't walk around with our chest uh, out and our nose up on high. No! We're not looking down at the world. We're just realizing that God has called us out of the world that we might be used for His glory. We're different. And we should show that we're different once we get saved. I hate it when a Christian gets saved and you never see a difference in them. I wonder if they got saved, to be honest with you, because the Bible says, behold, all things become new. You're, not, you're a new creature in Christ. Amen? Things should change. Your attitude, your thought processes, your actions may need to change, but something should change. If Christ has come in, something should be different. You should have a desire for church that wasn't there. You should be praying when you didn't before. You should want to do things that you've never done before. You should hate things that you do that you've always done because it's wrong. Things will be different <coughs> or should be different. Just like cats and dogs are different. Men and women are different as well. You know, today they're pushing for unisex stuff. We've been talking about it for a while. I mean, at first they come out, they was pushing for the homosexuals. They wanted them out of the closet. Well, we didn't raise our voice enough because they got to come out of the closet. They even passed a law here in North Carolina where they can, they can legally get married now. Uh, we voted it down, but you can thank again a governor, in a, or excuse me, it was a judge that time, who said that we couldn't do it. Uh, we need to show him we can and vote him out next chance we get. Amen? Amen. Get rid of them when they don't do what you want. Get rid of them. That's, what, that's the way it's set up. That's the way it ought to be. If they don't do their job, get rid of them. And Roy Cooper's days is numbered, I hope. Amen? Amen. There's a few of them I'd like to get rid of. Get them out of there because they're not doing a good job. I mean, I'll just say it like it is. I ain't going to be shy about it. He ain't ashamed to do it. I ain't ashamed to tell it. Amen. Right. <laughs> That's kind of funny that you think about it. But think about this. They they want to push this homosexuality on us, and they did. Now they're wanting to go a step further. I never even dreamed. Whoever dreamed they would go this far. Now they want to, they want you to be able to identify as whatever you want, whether you're a boy or a girl. You can get up and you can you can have the anatomy of a boy, but I'm a girl. And then start going into girls' bathrooms. They tried to push that on us. How stupid is that? Yep. How ignorant is that? They're trying to make you to say everything one, and one bathroom for all, one locker room for all, and all this stuff. That's not how God set it up. That's right. Today we got men dressing like women, and they're giving them TV shows, transvestites, queers, we got butch lesbians, and dressing up like men. Uh, the, I, I guess the best scenario or the best picture of what I'm trying to talk about would have been Michael Jackson. Was he white or was he black? <laughs> was he male or was he female? When they show a picture of him as a kid and then you see a picture of him after all the surgeries and all the things that he had done to himself, you're wondering, what is that? <laughs> Amen. I'm being honest with you. 
What is that? You, you don't know what the difference is. Was he black or white, boy or girl? I got to thank him. Don't ask Roy Cooper or the Democrats up in Washington. Yep. They wouldn't know. They, they would say you'd have the right to identify as you please. I say... If by the time they come out of kindergarten, if they don't know if they're a boy or a girl, put them back in kindergarten. Don't put them in an office somewhere and let them call the shots. If they don't know by the time they get out of kindergarten, they're a little slow. Something ain't quite right. Put them back through and let them come through again. Amen? Yeah. That's common, simple stuff. Hey, ain't it funny? I was listening to them on TV the other day. I know this is going off the rails a little bit, but I'm going to go off rails just a little bit. I was listening to them on TV when they was extending the, 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 the stay-at-home orders and stuff, and they said, we're going to follow science and the data. Ain't that funny? You ignored science back there when the queers come along, and when everybody wanted to identify differently, you ignored science then, but now all of a sudden science is the answer? Oh, my, I got more sense than that. But listen, how do you apply this biblical separation to your life? How can you apply? How can this biblical separation help you? Well, first of all, I'll tell you, in marriage and dating, it can help you. In marriage and dating, uh, young people, listen to this. If they ain't worth marrying, if there's someone if, if you should not marry and you know you shouldn't marry them, you shouldn't date them. If they're not marriage material, they're not dating material. If you shouldn't spend the rest of your life with them, what do you want to spend the next two years with them for? Or two months? Or two weekends? Or two hours? If it's not somebody you're supposed to be marrying. Oh my. Let's go on. That boy, I can go over like a lead balloon. It's wrong. It's wrong. If it's wrong to marry him, it's wrong to marry him. Secondly, the music. Music. Boy, I tell you what, that gets you in trouble today. God gave us a list of music to listen to. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. If it should not be played in church, it should not be played in your house. If you wouldn't sing it in church, what are you singing it for? Are you with me? Amen. If it's wrong to do it in God's house, it's wrong to do it in your house. Amen. 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 There's a little bit about music. And hey, maybe even the ministry. How, how does that apply to the ministry? Well, you know, I don't join the promise keepers. And while I'm pastor, I'm going to do everything by my power to keep you from joining the promise keepers. You say, what? You against men being better men and men having character and no, I'm all for that. I'm just against men joining up with lost people and Mormons and Catholics and all different denominations with all different beliefs, with all different Bibles, with all different standards and not put the emphasis on the Word of God. That's why I'm against them because they're putting things together that does not belong together. How about this one? I'm not going to join up with the Southern Baptist movement. Now that may come off a little, a little hard, brother Lou. If you would please just sit on the back, back there for a second. We'll, I'll talk to you in a minute. Just yeah. But anyway, uh, uh, don't join up with the with the the Southern Baptist movement. You say, Pre preacher, I got some Southern Baptist friends. I do too. I got so I know some really good Southern Baptists, some good Southern Baptist men, Southern Baptist women, love God, want to serve God. They just got in with the wrong group. They don't realize that. What do you say? It's what's so bad about the Southern Baptists? The Southern Baptists have compromised. They have left the standard of the King James Bible. Many of them are allowing different versions in their Sunday school classes and being used in different vacation Bible schools. Many of them have allowed contemporary music to come in and sway and pervert the minds and hearts of their own people. They have supported missionaries that don't believe the book. They have supported missionaries and mission trips that are not biblical in nature at all. They have no standard or character a lot of times in those trips. I'm just calling it like it is. Things that are different are not the same and they're not to be put together. Amen. Amen. That's right. Boy, I tell you, that goes over like a lead balloon sometimes. I know some are good men, great men. 
but they'll cause you to compromise if you spend too much time with them. They allow these big named authors to come in because they're famous and they've preached at this convention and this school and that school and they get them to come in and they don't even care that they don't believe the King James Bible. Oh, they'll get in the pulpit and they'll say, we believe this old black book, this King James Bible's the inspired and inerrant word of God and all the Bible say amen. Then you go buy their books and they're correcting the King James Bible. Right, right and in their books, they tell you different than what they say in the pulpit. Amen. They're fakes, they're phonies, they're frogs. They're putting on a show. Yep. That's right. Amen. Amen. And it's more than one. It is in this county and every county close to us. Right. 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 I'm just calling it like it is this morning. They allow these big name singers to come in too. Uh -huh. Woo! I ain't gonna name any of them. You might know them. <laughs> but some of these big name singers, they'll be singing in the Southern Baptist Church this week, and they'll be in a holiness Pentecostal church next week. No convictions, no standards. Whoever's got the money gets the time. Whoever's got the money gets the meeting. They don't care what you believe, which Bible it is, what you profess. They just want to sing. Can't we all just get along? That's Ron the King how that works. No convictions, no power, just fleshly. Preacher, we've come a long way. People are getting together. People are worshiping together now. People are getting along. You're trying to take us back. No, no. But you just told me what you were. I see you think big crowds being entertained and having the acceptance of the world is success. It's not. Listen, you got what you wanted, entertain the big crowd, the acceptance of the world, but you lost what you had. You had the power of God. You had revival. You had men and women surrendering their lives to Christ and would live for Him. Not just say it, but do it. Live for Him. Then men would surrender to preach and they wanted to preach and they were eager to preach and they wanted to see souls saved. Not their name on a billboard. Not their name under some track. Not be able to sign somebody's Bible. They wanted to preach that souls would be saved. There was a difference. You got what you wanted. Worldly entertainment. Fleshly. Yeah. Yeah. Fulfillment. Yeah. Somebody's turning green. I'm running out of time. So I'm going to conclude <laughs> number three. Thirdly, let's conclude. Let me give you a verse here out of 1 Peter. In 1 Peter 1 verse 15. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Yep. When we follow biblical separation, it shows several things. It shows our obedience is sincere. It shows we're sincere when we separate and do what God says. Yep. It also exposes the evil of our day mm -hmm. by our avoiding it. It exposes it. By our warning others of it, it exposes the error of the day. Thirdly, it makes us more like Christ. That's the goal, is it not? Amen. Fourthly, if for no other reason we ought to practice biblical separation for this, Amen. it pleases God. Yeah. It pleases God. It glorifies God. And lastly, it brings the blessings of God. When you follow the Lord's commands and you separate from the world and you do what you ought to do, God blesses it. When you don't, He judges it. It's that simple. It's that simple. The problem is today, everybody wants to get as close to the edge as they can. They want to straddle the fence. They want to have the best of both worlds. It don't work that way. I guess the best illustration I can think of is a famous illustration. There was a stage company, stagecoach company in the America West, Midwest, that advertised for drivers. At the job interview, they only had one question. How close can you drive to the edge of the cliff and maintain control while going up that mountain? And there's four or five applicants there, and the first one got up and said, he looked back at the others and said, I can get within two feet of the edge at 
full speed with the horses. And he was just, <laughs> within two feet. He said, I'm thinking you can be seated. And called up the next one. He got up there and he looked around. He said, I can get within 18 inches, a foot and a half. He said, oh, well, thank you, thank you, thank you, that's good to know. Thank you, thank you, you can be seated. He called up the next one. He said, I can get right on the edge. I can just run that edge so close it ain't even fun. You couldn't put a hair's breadth in between the wheel of the stagecoach and the edge. So thank you. You can be seated. And the next one gets up. He says, I can go around that curve with only three wheels. One would be hanging off. The occupant, occupants could look down into hell if it were open. That's how close I can get to the edge. And then finally, there was one more old black man sitting there, and he said, uh, did you come today for the job opportunity? He said, yes, yes, I sure did. He said, well, how close can you get to the edge? He says, I, I was afraid of heights, sir. I stay as far from the edge as I can. He got the job. He's the one that got the job. Christians, we're, we're trying to outdo each other. and It's like we're seeing who can get the closest to sin and who can get the closest to this or that without messing up. We ought to be just like that wise old black man and want no part to, with that edge and stay as far away from it as we can. They talk about social distancing because of fear of coronavirus. And the world changes. God's been preaching biblical changing. Biblical, excuse me, biblical separation for years. Yes. And no one is listening. Yeah. It's doing more damage than coronavirus. It's ruining more lives. It's wrecked more nations. And it's damning people to hell. Refusal to listen to his word. One time, a college professor, he was teaching in a college. And he, 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 was a, uh, he, he was a chemistry teacher. And he was teaching on different types of alcohol. And he was explaining ethanol. Ethanol alcohol is the type of alcohol that is in beverages, and methanol alcohol is the deadly poison that kills you quickly. He said, if you ingested this methanol, if you woke up in the morning, you would be blind if you woke up at all. It would kill you quickly. And when the students asked, well, why is one poison and one not? And the chemistry teacher said, they're both poison." One just kills you quicker than the other. Uh -huh. Just because you've got away with it and it hasn't killed you yet, don't mean it ain't poison. Uh -huh. If God says, come out from among them, I promise you it's for our good. Amen. It's for our good. Yes, sir. Amen. He's done it for our good. Church, we should live a Christian life separated from the world. Don't get mad at me for preaching the truth. Don't get mad at Brother Ryan for telling your kids the same thing I'm saying to you. We need to come out from among them. Amen. That's right. Love not the world. Be not conformed to this world. Father, I do want to thank you for this day and thank you for the opportunity you give us, Lord, to preach here today. Father, we're going to be dismissed in just a moment. And I pray, Lord, as they go and they travel their way, that they put thought to what's said. And, Lord, that they'll, they'll consider what has been said here today and they'll put it into practice in their life and father we do love you and thank you for all that you do for us in jesus name amen, amen.